First, uh, just a very few words about Yehuda Halevi's place and time and where he needs to be positioned in the context of Jewish history and geography. Halevi was born in Spain in approximately 1070, or between 1070 and 1075. We don't know the exact date of his birth. Spain in Halevi's day was divided roughly in half between the Christian north and the Muslim South. And Halevi himself was born in the North in Christian Spain. But uh, having received as a child, as most Jewish children did in those days, a very, very intense Hebrew education, and having uh, shown talent and skill for the writing of Hebrew poetry at a, at a young age, he left his home at the age of probably 15 or 16 or so, and traveled by himself to southern or Muslim Spain because in terms of literary culture and literary sophistication and uh, the level of, of, of literature and poetry, Muslim Spain was far more developed than Christian Spain. And it's important to understand uh, in this respect that although the Jews of Muslim Spain lived in Arabic, they spoke Arabic, they to each other, and of course, to say nothing of their Muslim neighbors, they wrote Arabic for the most part. But when they wrote poetry, it was always and only in Hebrew. So that uh, although the poetry they wrote was very influenced by Arabic poetry, as was Jewish culture and the Arab world in general, it was written only for themselves, to be read only by themselves, because no one else could read it. So Yehuda Halevi, as a young man, I say he, he was only a teenager at the time, comes south to Andalusia, to Muslim Spain, and leads a very, apparently from what we know from his poetry, uh, leads a bohemian student life there. He studies for a while in the yeshiva, the great yeshiva of Lucena in southern Spain. He wanders from city to city, from town to town. He falls in with other young people, other aspiring young poets. And all the time, he's looking really for a patron, because poets lived off patronage. They, they, lived, they needed to be able to make a living from poetry. They needed somebody to support them. And he indeed finds several patrons, the, the best known of which is Moshe Ibn Ezra, himself a very great Hebrew poet and a literary critic, who was perhaps 15 or 20 years older than Halevi at the time. He also makes a living by writing verses of poetry for occasions. People hire him to write poems for weddings, for funerals, for other occasions. Uh, this was very much done in Muslim Spain. Poetry was a uh, almost indispensable element in any occasion of importance in Muslim Spain, both for the Arabs and for the Jews. And Halevi was very good at this. If I had more time, I'd read you one or two of his poems that he wrote, for instance, for the weddings of, I think, young men and women whom he didn't even know, whom he wrote for the funerals of, of people whom he didn't know. He was hired to do this, and he did it very well, and was also, when he was young, a way of making a living. He also wrote a great deal of poetry for use in synagogues, which was another way that poets supported themselves in Muslim Spain. Uh, that they wrote poems that were incorporated into the liturgy and sung as part of the prayer service. So here is this young man, this Yehuda Halevi, who is beginning to get a reputation as a poet in southern Spain. Um, he writes poems about nature, he writes poems about friendship, he writes poems to his friends, he writes poems for his patrons. He even writes a few little love poems that are very trivial and, and, and uh, certainly not very intense or profound. He's very talented, but he's, he's not a great Hebrew poet yet. And then one day, 
Yehuda Levi sits down, I say one day, although it could be one week or one month, I don't know how long it took him. I would guess he was a man, a young man in his early 20s at this point, although we, we don't know exactly. Yehuda Levi sits down and writes what is probably the greatest love poem in the Hebrew language apart from Shira Shirim, apart from the Song of Songs. I'm going to read you this poem now. Um, just to give you a, a word or two about the context, the poem is written, we don't know who the woman, the young woman whom the poem was written, we don't know who she is, who she was. It's clear from the poem that Yehuda Halevi had a very intense romantic relation with this woman, that it was apparently sexual in nature, and that at, at some point she left him and went away. And, Left, left the city he was living in and left him and went traveling somewhere. And such a relationship, by the way, I think would have been very unusual in Muslim Spain of those days because generally uh, romantic or certainly sexual relations between young men and young women did not exist. And uh, now I'm going to read the poem in, in Hebrew a few lines at a time and I'll, I'll comment. Malach uh, tzviya <laughs> Slaav malut sirayech. Lo ted i ki en de dodech mizman del tishmoa kol shlomotayech. Im ha trida al shnenu nigzara. Im dimaat ad echeze panayech. Lo eda im ben slaai ne et sar libi. Ve im yelech la masaayech. So here, as I say, we have the basic situation. This, this woman has left him. And he misses her, and he yearns for her. Chei ahava, zichri yemei chishkech, k'mo ezkor ani lelot shukotayich. K'asher dmutech bin chalomi yavor, ken ebrana b'chalomotayich. Beni uvenech yam dmaot yehamu galav, v'lo uchal avor elayich. Ach, lu pa'amayich l'evro karvu, I don't know exactly how it sounds in the Russian. In, in Hebrew, those of you who have been able to follow it all will have noticed that every long line ends with the same two syllables, the syllables ayich. This was the Arabic and the medieval Spanish Hebrew way of rhyming. It was what's called monorhyme, and it, it means that the same rhyme was used throughout a poem, no matter how long or short the poem was. Now, ayich is not an accidental rhyme here. It's very much part of the poem for two reasons. First of all, those of you who know a little Hebrew know that ayich is the, the possessive feminine suffix. In other words, panayich, your face, masa uh, ayich, your travels, chukotayich, your desires, etc. So that every line here ends with his turning to the woman with a suffix, this ayich suffix is directed to her, and it repeats itself over and over and over. But ayich also sounds very much like the Hebrew ayich, which means, where are you? So it's also as at the end of every line, the poet is asking, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Uh, when also, if you follow this poem closely, it's, it's an extraordinary poem, but you'll see how Often Halevi plays on Jewish, traditional Jewish imagery, or, and particularly biblical imagery. He weaves it in and out of the poem. You, you see it, for instance, when, when he says, um, he speaks of a sea of tears that now separate him from the woman he loves. And he says, He's comparing he doesn't say so in so many words, but anyone, who, who, any reader who was Jewishly educated, and all his readers would have had to be Jewishly educated to read him, any of his readers would have understood the comparison to the splitting of the Red Sea by Moses, and would have understood the almost audacity of the comparison that when, when he says to this woman that you have the power simply by putting your foot in the water of the sea, or, or approaching it, to split it as, as Moses would have split the Red Sea. I'll read the next two lines. Lu achrei moti, 
‫באזני יעלה כל פעמון זהב ‫עלי שולייך, ‫ותשאלי לשלום ידידך משאול, ‫אשאל בדודייך ובשלומייך. These, uh, ‫The bells that he imagines hearing, ‫of course, are, are the golden bells ‫on her, the skirt of her dress, ‫which women wore. ‫So as, the, as women would walk, ‫the bells would tinkle on their dresses. ‫And, and Halevi is, is always in his poetry ‫one of the most musical of Hebrew poets. ‫He's, he's one of the great geniuses in Hebrew ‫at, at sound at, at, and, and at putting together ‫words and sounds. ‫And I'll just give you one little... Example here, um, well, when he says that even if he were underground in the grave, he would hear the bells on his beloved's dress and would ask about her. The Hebrew goes, O tishali le shlom yedidech mi shaol eshal betodayach uvishlomayach. Listen to it again. O tishali le shlom yedidech mi shaol eshal betodayach uvishlomayach. This concentration of sh and la, the shin and the lamed, is just beautifully done in this line. And Yudal Levi does that kind of thing over and over in his poetry. And now our poem suddenly changes tone. It, it goes from a tone of terrible grief, I would say, and of missing this woman, to a tone of anger at her for having left him. Achen, alei shofchech d'mei libi shnei edim l'chayayich v'siftotayich. Ech tomri lo chen, v'heim edai alei d'dami v'al ki shafchu yadayich. מתח בצים אותי, ואין אחבוץ אני שנים להוסיף על שני חייך. אם תגזלי נאומי בליל חשקי, הלא אתן שנת עיניי לאף אפייך. And again, it's typical of Halevi that with all the tremendous emotion involved here, the poem is nevertheless very witty. As we know in Jewish law, two witnesses are required to convict anyone of a crime. So when Halevi says that I have two witnesses against you, he's referring really to the Jew Jewish legal context. But who are these two witnesses? They're the woman's cheeks and her lips. And why are they witnesses? Because they're red. Her cheeks and lips are red. And he's just said he, she, she has spilled his blood. And these are the witnesses. They're red with his blood. ממי דמעות לכך אישך, וגם אבני לבבות שחקו ממייך. באתי באש חשקך ומי וכי אהה ליבי בדמעותי וגחלייך. בן מר ומתוק יעמוד ליבי והם, ראש הנדוד ודבש נשיקותייך. אחרי דברייך כפכים רגעו אותו, טילים קיצצו ידייך. And now the, the poem once again changes tone. We, we've said, I've said it's, it's gone from grief to anger, or recrimination. Now suddenly, the, as the poet begins to imagine the woman who has made him so angry by leaving him, his anger begins to fade because the sheer vision of her beauty overcomes him again with, with longing and love for her. <laughs> שמש בפנייך, וליל תפרסי על זוהרו, אבי קפוצותייך. משי ורקמה הם כסות גופך, אבל החן והיופי כסות עינייך. מזכית עלמות מעשה יד איש, ואת ההוד והחמדה זכיותייך. חרס וסהר, אש וחימה, קנאו להיות כאחייך ואחיותייך. בנים ובנות חשבו אם חבשו להיות עבדייך ושפחותייך. לא אשאלה מהון זמן חלקי לבד מחוץ שפתייך חגור מתנייך. יערי ודבשי בין שפתייך כמו נרדי ומורי בין שני שדייך. And now the poem comes to its final climax and it begins to do so with a rather astonishing Comparison. Samtich kachotam al yemini, lu ani ehye kachotam al zroatayich, 
אשכח ימיני משמאלי יעלה, אם אשכחה אהבת כלולותייך. The first part of this uh, comparison or metaphor in Hebrew is, is not so astonishing because it's simply taken from the song of songs, from Shir HaShirim, the, the poet says here, Samtir kachotam al yamini, I've put you like a seal on my right hand, and that of course is, is, is Samini kachotam comes from the song of songs, which is a love poem too. But, but then the, po the poet says, Eshkach yamini mi smoli alai meshkach, what is he playing here, here on? He's playing on the psalm, the Mizmor from Sefer Tehilim, and, and he's saying to this woman, in effect, you are my Jerusalem. And, and this is ast astonishing, as they say, first of all, the poem itself is astonishing. There's nothing like this in Hebrew literature from the time of Shir Shirim until Yehuda Levi's day. But then for Yehuda Alevi to come and say to a woman, you are my Jerusalem, it's unheard of. I mean, where in Jewish tradition does someone have the, the chutzpah to say such a thing? פקדי ביום פוקדך לחיות חללי חשקך ויום בו יחיו מיתייך נפשי להשיב על גביעתי ביום נושאך בצאתך יצאה אחרייך. בשלום ידידך ילד חן שאלי אם הזמן ישאל שאלותייך שובי בצורנו ישיבך אל מחוז חפצך ואל ארץ מחורותייך We don't know if this woman ever returned to the city in which Halevi was living. We don't know who she was. He never wrote her another poem. He never wrote anyone another poem like this. This is the only erotic, really erotic love poem that Judah Halevi ever wrote. When eventually he married and took a wife, clearly it was not this woman. Because his marriage, although we know nothing about it, uh, does not seem to have inspired in him any deep feeling or, or any poetry at all, for that matter. So Halevi marries, he acquires a profession, he studies medicine and becomes a doctor, and a rather successful doctor, it would appear. He has children, he has one daughter who actually grows up to be an adult whom we know about. From his Poetry, I suspect that he had two other children who died in childhood, but we don't know this for a fact. He's now a man of middle age. We've just jumped 20 or 25 or 30 years in a few minutes. He's a very successful doctor. He's very active in the Jewish community. He's moved now back to Toledo in Christian Spain. Um, he's a very respected physician, poet, much acclaimed very popular. There's a, a discontent in him. There's a feeling that something is missing. There's a feeling that he has a mission in life to fulfill, but he doesn't know what that mission is. He writes many poems. He had many friends. He writes many poems of friendship, which was a, a, a very common genre in those days, poems to people whom he admired, whom he liked. But we never again feel anything like the love that he wrote about for the woman in the poem I read to you. And then, then one night, and again, this, this is, I want to emphasize this is in a way my reconstruction. But one night, Yehuda Halevi has a dream. And he writes a poem about this dream. And this is the poem he writes. This is a short poem. Elohai mishkenotecha yedidot v'kirvatcha b'mar'eh 
לא בחידות. הביאני חלומי מקדשי אל, ושרתי מלאכותיו החמודות, והעולה ומנחתיו הנזקה, וסביב תמרות עשן כבדות. ונאמתי בשומעי שיר לוויים בשורדיהם לסדר העבודות. הקיצותי, ועודי עמך אל, והודיתי, ולך נאה להודות. What is this dream? Halevi dreams that he is in the temple, in the days of the temple when it still stood and sacrifices were still being performed. He sees the smoke rising from the sacrifices, and he hears the singing of the Leviim, of the Levites, who are performing the, or assisting the priests in performing the ceremony. And it's important in reading this poem, of course, to remember that Halevi, as his name indicates, is a Levi himself. He's dreaming, in a way, of his own participation as a Levi in the sacrifice. So he wakes from the dream and he writes this poem. And in my reconstruction of the sequence of events, this is the first of the sequence of Halevi poems known as Shirei Tzion, or, or, or Songs of Zion, for which he is largely known today, and which constitute some of his greatest poetry. And he begins, over the following years, to write a series of poems about his yearning for Jerusalem, for Tzion. They go from one poem to another over a period of several years. His determination to actually go to Jerusalem and to be in Jerusalem becomes stronger and stronger. But something else happens in these poems too, and I'm now going to read you one of them in which I, I want to show you what it is. This is a poem addressed to Jerusalem. Yefei nof mesos tevel kiriya lemelech rav lach nechsafa nafshi mi paate ma'arav hamun רחמי נחמר כי אזכרה קדם, כבודך אשר גלה ונווך אשר חרב. ומי יתנני על כנפי נשרים עד ערבה בדמתי אפרך ויתערב. דרשתיך, ואם מלכך אין בך, ואם במקום צרי גלעד נחש שרף וגם הקרב, הלא את אבנייך אכונן ואשקם. This is a love poem, and it, it's a love poem to Jerusalem with a very strong erotic component. When, when the poet at the end imagines coming to Jerusalem and kissing her stones and her earth, which tastes like honey in his mouth, He's consciously using sexual imagery here. And I think the first person, as far as I know, to really, the first literary critic, if you will, to really have noticed this was the great Jewish poet Heinrich Heine. And Heine quite correctly said that all of Halevi's poems to Zion are love poems. They're just love poems to a place, but not to a woman but they're a place imagined as a woman. Now, in some respects, this is part of Jewish tradition. I mean, we know in the Bible, Jerusalem is often compared to a woman, or uh, we read in the Bible, Petulat Bat Zion, you know, the, the, the maiden of Zion, and so on and so forth. This image is very common. But in the Bible and in the prophets, Jerusalem's lover is always God. It's not the prophet, whereas here, the lover is Halevi himself. Now, you may ask, well, fine, you may say, so Yehuda Halevi, when he's young, writes a beautiful love poem to a woman who is absent, who has left him, and now he writes love poetry to Jerusalem, to Zion, to the land of Israel, which also is absent, it's far away. He dreams of it, but cannot see it or touch it. But is there really a connection between these two loves? I think for Yehuda HaLevi, there clearly was a connection in his own mind. And I think he makes that connection clearest in what is perhaps the best known and 
perhaps the most beautiful of all his songs of Zion. It's a poem that was very well known in Jewish tradition. And by the way, in, in Jewish history, most of Yudah Levi's poetry was lost. Uh, the only poems that survived until the 19th century, when the others were rediscovered, were the liturgical poems, the poems that were used in synagogues. But although the poem I'm about to read to you was not originally written for liturgical use, it entered the Jewish liturgy soon after Halevi's death because it became part of the Sefer Kinot, the Book of Lamentations that was read in synagogue on Tisha B'Av all through the Jewish world. It's a poem that every Jew who went to, to synagogue and prayed was familiar with. And as I read it section by section in Hebrew, I would like you to pay attention to two things. One is that the rhyme, the monorhyme in this poem is again Ayich. And it's the only other poem that Yehuda HaLevi ever wrote that has that rhyme. There are only two poems in his whole work that rhyme with Ayich. Grammatically, it ends with Ayich because he's, he's addressing a woman again. He's addressing Jerusalem. And the same hidden echo, echo of Ayich, where are you, that we heard in the earlier love poem, one hears in this poem too. The second thing to notice is how the progression of emotions in this poem very closely follows the progression of emotions in the great love poem that we read at the beginning. The poem begins on a note of terrible grief, the grief of separation, in that case the separation of Halevi or of the Jewish people from Jerusalem. It then passes to a note of anger and frustration, uh, in this case, not, as in the previous poem, anger at Jerusalem, the way Halevi was angry at the woman who left him, but anger at what has been done to Jerusalem by those who have usurped the Jews' place. And, and Halevi is here referring to the Christians and the Muslims. We have to remember that this poem was written during the Crusades, when Christians and Muslims were battling for Palestine between them. And finally, just as the previous love poem that we read passes from that note of anger and frustration to a kind of reconciled hope for reunion and for a restoration of the love that has been lost. So this poem ends on the same note with a, 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 a hope of, for restoration, a hope for Jerusalem's return or for the Jewish people's and the poet's return to Jerusalem. Tzion. הלא תשאלי לשלום אסירייך, דרשי שלומך והם יתר אדרייך. מים ומזרח ומצפון ותימן, שלום רחוק וקרוב שאי מכל עברייך. ושלום אסיר תאווה, נותן דמעיו כטל חרמון ונחשף לרדתם על הררייך. לבכות עינותך אני תנים. ואת אכלום שיבת שבותך, אני כינור לשירייך. Those of you, by the way, who know Naomi Shemer's lovely Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, will note that the image of אני כינור לשירייך, I am the, the lute or the, the, the violin that plays all your songs, comes from this poem of Yehuda Levi. ליבי לבית אל ולפני אל מאוד יהמה, ולמחניים וכל פגעי טהורייך. שם השכינה שכנה לך, והיוצרך פתח למול שערי שחק שערייך, וכבוד אדוני לבד היה מאורך, ואין שמש וסהר וכוכבים מאירייך. איך אחד אבחר לנפשי להשתפך במקום אשר רוח אלוהים שפוכה על בחירייך. את בית מלוכה, ואת כיסא אדוני. ואיך שישבו עבדים עלי כיסאות גבירייך. מי יתנני משוטט במקומות אשר נגלו אלוהים לחוזייך וצירייך? מי יעשה לי כנפיים וארחיק נדוד? עניד לוויתרי לבבי בין פטרייך. אפול לאפי עלי ארצך וארצה אבנייך מאוד ואחונן את עפרייך. אף כי ועומדי עלי קברות אבותי ואשתומם בחברון עלי מבחר כפרייך. אעבור ביערך וכרמילך, ואעמוד בגלעדך 
ואשתוממה אל הר עברייך, הר העברים והור ההר, אשר שם שני אורים גדולים, מאירייך ומורייך. חיי נשמות אוויר ארצך, וממור דרור אבקת עפרך ונופת סוף נהרייך. ינאם לנפשי הלוך ערום ויחף עלי חורבות שוממה אשר היו דבירייך. במקום ארונך אשר נגנז, ובמקום קרובייך אשר שכנו חדרי חדרייך. אגוז ואשליך פאר נזרי, ואקוב זמן חילל בארץ טמאה את נזירייך. איך יערב לי אכול ושתות בעת אחזה, כי יסחבו הכלבים את כפירייך. And the reference here, as I said, is to the Christians and the Muslims who are compared to, to crows and dogs tearing up. And now the poem moves to its final concluding stage. It moves away again from this anger and frustration, as I put it, and it moves into a, a final note of hope for the future. Kos ha'yegonim la'at, harpi ma'at, ki chvar mal'u chsalai v'nafshi mimorayach, et eskara o'hala, אשתך אמתך, ואזכור או הליבה ואמצא את שמרייך. ציון, ציון כלילת יופי, אהבה וכן תקשרי מאז, ובך נקשרו נפשות חברייך, הם השמחים לשלוותך, והכואבים על שוממותך, ובורחים על שברייך. מבור שבי שואפים נגדך ומשתחווים איש ממקומו אלי נוכח שערייך. עדרי המונך אשר גלו והתפזרו מהר לגבעה ולא שכחו נדרייך. המחזיקים בשולייך ומתאמצים לעלות ולאחוז בסנסיני תמרייך. שנער ופטרוס הירחוך בגודלם ועם הבלם ידמו לטומייך ואורייך. אל מי ידמו משיחייך, ואל מי נביאייך, ואל מי לוויייך ושרייך. ישנה ויחלוף כליל כל ממלכות האליל, חוסנך לעולם, לדור ודור נזרייך. איבך למושב אלוהייך, ואשרי אנוש יבחר, יקרא וישכון בחצרייך. אשרי מחכה ויגיע ויראה עלות אורך. ויבקעו עליו שחרייך, לראות בטובת בחירייך ולעלוז בשמחתך, בשובך אלי קדמת נעורייך. The last line is almost the same as the last line of the great love poem we, we read earlier, the, the line that says, that said before, שובי אל מחורתייך, come back to your native grounds. Now, Yehuda Alevi, as I said, and I think it's obvious, was aware of the parallels between these two great love poems. In the first poem, if you remember, the woman is compared to Jerusalem. In the second poem, Jerusalem is compared to a woman. Now, I don't think that Halevi was trying to say that love for a woman and love for Jerusalem are exactly the same thing. I think he was saying that love is a continuum, that sexual love and devotional religious love of the sort we see in the second poem are not opposites. And that in this continuum of love and in this ability to imagine Zion as a beloved whom the poet yearns for, Halevi, I think, restored to himself something he had lost. In any case, this kind of yearning for Jerusalem with this kind of in intense, almost erotic language is something we never see before Halevi in Jewish history. Now Halevi himself, and this is one of the great legends of Jewish history, Halevi himself as a man in his late 60s perhaps, after many years of struggle, left Spain and went to live in Eretz Yisrael. I say many years of struggle because there was a great deal to struggle about. Palestine, as I said before, in Halevi's age, was a wasteland. It was a war zone between Muslims and Christians in which the Jewish community, had, which was never big, large to begin with, had been almost totally destroyed. 
One of the first things the Christians did in the year 1099 when they captured Jerusalem was they herded all the Jews into a synagogue and burnt them alive there. And the small Jewish communities elsewhere in the country were decimated also. So here was this man who was well off, who, as I say, was greatly admired in Spain, who was one of the lionized figures in the community. And when he announced that he was going to live, leaving Spain and, and going by himself to Teres Israel, people, I think, were, were, were simply unable to, to grasp what he was doing. And we know from his own poetry that his friends and acquaintances pleaded with him not to do it. They, they, what, they said to him, what are you doing? Where are you going? This is madness. But Halevi leaves Spain. He leaves Spain in the year 1140. And he sails first for Egypt because there was no direct shipping connection between Spain and Palestine. You had to go first to Egypt and then take a local boat up the coast to Jaffa or to, to Akko. Now, until about 60 years ago, it was known that Halevi reached Egypt because he wrote several poems in Egypt that survived and, and uh, came down to the present time. But it was not known at all if he ever left Egypt for Palestine or ever reached Eretz Israel. There was a legend that he did reach the gates of Jerusalem, that he knelt down to kiss the ground in prayer outside the gates of Jerusalem. And as he was doing so, a horseman, an Arab horseman, rode over him with his horse and trampled him to death. But scholars never took this legend seriously, partly because it's a very late legend, relatively. The legend first appears in print in the 16th century. Yehuda Halevi died in the 12th century. So obviously a story that first is found 400 years after someone's death cannot be considered reliable. And in fact, uh, it was widely considered by many scholars that Halevi died in Egypt and never reached Palestine. And curiously, in my own edition of the great 32-volume Encyclopedia Ivrit, the Israeli Hebrew Encyclopedia that began to be, that was published largely in the 50s. Under Yehuda Halevi, the article begins, Yehuda Halevi, Hebrew poet, etc., born Spain about 1040, died in Egypt in 11, uh, born Spain about 1070, died in Egypt in 1140. Today, we know that that's not true. We know that Yehuda Halevi did sail from Egypt for Palestine. We even know the exact date he sailed on. And we know it because of an astonishing discovery that was made in the Cairo Gniza, in the great collection of medieval documents that was found at the end of the 19th century in the attic of a synagogue in Cairo. In the 1950s, a very well-noted scholar named Dov Goitain, who taught both at the Hebrew University and then later at Princeton University in the United States, found in the Gniza uh, a batch of documents which were written in Judeo-Arabic, which means they were written in medieval Arabic but in Hebrew script, found a collection of letters that belonged to an acquaintance of Halevi's who lived in Cairo, a man named Khalfon ben Netanel. A collection of correspondences, it was essentially like a file cabinet, were many letters that mentioned Halevi and even several letters written to Khalfon ben Netanel by Halevi himself. Most of these letters have to do with Halevi's last months in Egypt, and one of them was written by a man who actually saw Halevi off on the ship from which he was sailing from Alexandria to Palestine, and says that he saw goodbye, I, he writes in the letter, I, I said goodbye today to Yehuda Halevi because the wind has changed and his ship is about to sail. And it's dated, it has a Hebrew date, but the, the English date, was May 14th, 1041. He sails by himself. The greatest Hebrew poet of the age, not a single Egyptian Jew is willing to accompany him because everyone is afraid of Crusader Palestine. And Halevi sails, and then his traces really do disappear. And yet not entirely because there are two more letters in the Cairo Gniza 
is written by a Jew in Cairo to a Jew in Damascus. No, rather, from a Jew in Damascus, I think, to a Jew in Cairo. It's dated November 1141. Yehuda Levi, as I said, sailed in May. And it, it mentions that three important Jews have died in the last several months, and one of them was Yehuda Halevi. So we know that Halevi apparently died uh, in the summer of 1141, several months after reaching Palestine. But the, the second letter is both less clear and even more tantalizing. It's written, again, uh, I forget exactly by whom, but, but it's, it's a letter written in Judeo-Arabic by one Jew to another. And in it, there's a passage referring to, that, to Yehuda Halevi, in which after his name appear the initials Zion Kuf Lamed. Now, now Zion Kuf Lamed is the Hebrew abbreviation of Zecher Kadosh Levracha. Now normally, when you, as, as, as some of you know, when you refer to a dead man or a dead person, you refer to him as Zecher Tzadik Levracha. Kadosh is a word which literally means saint, but it also means martyr in medieval Hebrew. So we have this passage referring to Yehuda Levi as Zecher, as, as a Kadosh. And then there are several lines of the letter that can't be read anymore. They're illegible because it's, it's a thousand years old. It lay in an attic for a thousand years and was in bad condition. And then there are two words that are legible. And once again, there are several lines that can't be read. And the two words that are legible are B'Sha'are Yerushalayim. Do those words refer to Yehuda Halevi? Do they confirm that the legend that first occurs 400 years later is true, that he really did die at the gates of Jerusalem? We don't know. I doubt that we'll ever know. But it is, in a way, an astounding ending to one of the great romantic legends in Jewish history. And you'll now see why when I say romantic, I mean it in both senses of the word. Thank mm -hmm. you.